only a few thousand people ever have seen the dance of the whooping crane. Your grandchildren may never see it. The whooping crane, the largest and many would say the most beautiful bird in North America, and one of the rarest. When they first were counted in 1937 at the Aransas National Wildlife Refuge, their winter home in Texas, there were only 18 of the great white birds. Today, despite a crusade of almost 40 years to save them, there are only about 60 wild whooping cranes an increase of little more than one bird a year. An epidemic or a natural disaster could wipe out the flock. They are still dangerously close to extinction. A mystical bird whose ancestry goes back long before the Ice Age. Is the whooping crane perhaps so aristocratic that it cannot adapt like less lordly creatures? There never were many whooping cranes, perhaps a few thousand in historical times. But man's westward thrust brought new dangers, destruction of their traditional breeding grounds, the cables of commerce across their ancient flight paths. People used them old big birds flying over. They used to have 22 and just shoot at them for sport. They, they knew nothing about it. We was very ignorant. In fact, it was a wild country and we'd shoot anything we'd seen if we thought it was a good to eat. And uh, I didn't love birds then. I didn't know nothing about them, you know, until the Audubon come down here and started living with us and teaching us right from wrong. Robert Porter Allen of the Audubon Society. Crusader, tireless champion of the whooping crane. In the grim aspect of the features, in the whole trim of the birds, there is a dignity and a sense of unconquered wildness, of an obstinate will to survive. When Alan began his crusade, little was known about the whooping crane. It was, it still is, a bird of stubborn mysteries. It took Alan 18 months to be able to study the shy bird at close range at the 50,000 acre Aransas Refuge of the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, a refuge established chiefly to protect the whooping crane. The adult whooping crane stands more than four feet tall, it wears a carmine crown, black primary feather. Its wingspan, maybe eight feet. But Alan was no mere observer. He waged a campaign among hunters and farmers along the whooping crane's migration route. Don't shoot any great white birds, was his plea. Across the Canadian border, Fred Bard of the Saskatchewan Natural History Museum was already crusading for the vanishing birds on the Canadian prairie, once a nesting area for the cranes. Searching in vain for remaining nests and rescuing crippled birds. Victoria Regina, Queenie for short with a broken leg. She ended her days in a wildlife refuge. Like Robert Porter Allen later, Fred Bard taught farmers and hunters to respect the great white birds. I just waited for a minute there by the side of the road and they kind of fluttered their wings a bit and I noticed the black. 
on the end of the wings, and that something told me that they might be uh, hooping cranes. Mm -hmm. they, they just looked to me like they stood about four feet high, you know. Yes, oh, they do all yes. that, yes. Long legs, and, and then we realized this morning how fast they covered that ground over to where they were when you people first saw them. Boy, we knew then that they had uh, a pretty, pretty long, long legs. Yeah, <laughs> they pretty good size step. That part of the crusade succeeded. No whooping crane has been reported lost to a hunter's gun since 1968. He mistook it for a snow goose and turned himself in. Fine, $500 plus cost. For many years, the cranes remained obstinately mysterious. How long did they live? No one knew. How to tell male from female? No one knew, their plumage was identical. At what age did they begin to breed? No one knew. Where did they mate? No one knew. And the most mysterious and urgent question, where did the Texas flock go in summer? Where was their nesting ground? Each April, the great white birds flew north some 2,500 miles, up the central flyway, high above Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, the Dakotas, Montana, and across the international border over Saskatchewan, Alberta. Then they disappeared, vanished. No one knew where. Could this tiny, elusive flock be saved? The fate of another flock in 1939 was a warning. There was a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico. John Lynch, retired U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service biologist, recalls the end of the Louisiana flock. Uh, this portion of Louisiana, including the places where the, uh, the uh, Louisiana resident uh, hooping cranes were nesting, got in the rainy quadrant of that hurricane. The so buffeting by hurricane winds drove the birds way inland where they were lost to cause or causes unknown. I'm sure perhaps more than one got shot, blown against trees, wires, uh, Lord knows what might have happened to them. Plus the fact they were then thrown into a strange environment where they didn't know what was safe and what wasn't. And it was at that time when Josephine was picked up and salvaged and brought down to the Audubon Park Zoo. And so far as we know, five others did survive and got back to the White Lake marshes where they had been in 1939. But we have no record of their nesting after 1939, not in the wild. This is Josephine. Sole survivor of the Louisiana flock. She became the storm center of controversy between those who, like Alan, wanted to concentrate on saving the last wild flock and those who wanted the insurance of breeding captive birds as well. This is George Douglas, the New Orleans zookeeper who searched five years for a mate for Josephine. This is Pete, a one-eyed male crane captured in Nebraska and eventually shipped to New Orleans as a mate for Josephine. But Josephine and Pete did not mate, which did not surprise Robert Porter Allen. They are shut up in a pen scarcely large enough for a pair of ducks. They must be moved, and moved soon. Though Allen's chief cause remained the wild flock, he installed Josephine and Pete in a spacious enclosure at the Aransas Refuge. Privacy, space, and the sea air seemed to work. They danced, and in the spring, Josephine laid two eggs. But on the 26th day, the eggs were smashed, apparently by the parents. Two months later, while Josephine whooped mournfully nearby, Pete was found dead on his back. The second attempt to breed captive whooping cranes had failed. Josephine, alone in her enclosure at the Aransas Refuge. The only captive whooping crane in the world. A proven breeder now, but in eight years, no chicks. A new mate must be found for her. 
There was at the refuge a wild crane, unable to migrate because of a crippled wing. He was thought to be a male. Crip, he was called, and he was put into Josephine's enclosure. Crip was a male. The next spring, the pair built a nest. In April, Alan saw a single egg in it. Late in May, triumph. Rusty, he was called, the first whooping crane ever born in captivity. But four days later, Alan found Rusty dead, killed by raccoons. And in December, George Douglas reclaimed Josephine. And to keep the pair intact, he was permitted to take Crip too, back to the crowded zoo in New Orleans. So Robert Porter Allen, who did not wish to see the crane saved solely in confinement, returned anew to the continuing mystery. Where did the wild flock go to nest? He decided on an air search in Canada's north flying more than 20,000 miles. We failed. This unknown place we are looking for is in truth a lost land. 1.40 p.m., rain squall, poor visibility all the way. This ends our search. That note was made when Alan was over the northwest corner of Wood Buffalo National Park in Canada's Northwest Territories. When the cranes returned to Texas each fall from their unknown nesting grounds, Robert Porter Allen and other scientists began to learn more about the mysterious birds and watched them loudly stake out their territories. In these birds, the windpipe which comes down the neck, comes down and curls, curves, goes into the breastbone. Yeah, this is a brown crane. Dr. Alex Wetmore of the Smithsonian Institution. Some of the sonorous sound of their cries is uh, aided by this uh, structure. As we get the uh, specimens of the uh, skeletons of these birds from Pleistocene time, Ice Age time, that are practically identical with the ones we see as we examine the living birds now. In fact, their evolution goes back, back of the Pleistocene. How far back we we do not know. These birds of ancient lineage almost always paired for life. They demanded large territories, about 450 acres per pair. It seems almost as if they draw an invisible line which none others may cross and which they do not cross. Whooping cranes insist on the aquatic foods of their primeval past, perhaps a limit to their adaptability. Clams are one of the major food items of the cranes. Uh, this is probably a phacoides clam, and this then is a rangia. This one is really a hard shell, just like a rock. Uh, it's amazing that the cranes swallow these clams whole. Some of them are even larger than these, particularly the angel wings. Probably their preferred food is a blue crab. The cranes will occasionally feed on a crab this size. Uh, the one I have seen them catch, they punctured him on the carapace here, picked him up with their beak from this angle where the crane, uh, crack where the crab couldn't reach them, uh, carried it up and then broke the crab open on the shore and broke it up and ate it in pieces. Until we get up into, into the refuge. 
Now I'd like to welcome you aboard the boat, Hoopy Queen. This is a 32-mile round trip. Guarantee it. We do show you the hooping cranes or your money and drink fuzzy. Now, folks, I have one of my very best friends that's on the boat here today, Mr. Earl Benham from the National Wildlife Refuge. By 30-something years, he was on that refuge. Now, if there's any questions you want to ask him about that birds or anything, if he doesn't know it, you just come to me and I'll answer them for you. The fame of the whooping cranes in the Aransas Refuge spread gradually, and crane watching became an important local industry. No longer shy of people in boats, the great white birds seem to have the touchy arrogance of celebrities, particularly late in the winter when tourists and scientists alike hope to be lucky enough to witness the courting dance of the whooping cranes. But after the dance was over, after the courting, the great mystery remained. Where did they go to nest? June 30th, 1954. A helicopter returning from fire patrol in Canada's Northwest Territories passed over the northwest corner of Wood Buffalo National Park. Telegram from W.A. Fuller, resident biologist, Canadian Wildlife Service, to Ottawa headquarters. Four, possibly six, whooping cranes seen Wood Buffalo Park. Group included pair with one young. Here in one of the most remote wild parks in the world, a park as large as the whole of Denmark, the mystery of the nesting grounds was solved. It's like the clanging of a bell to an old fire horse. The season was too late for Alan to respond like a fire horse, but with enormous effort, he and Ray Stewart of the Canadian Wildlife Service reached their goal the next summer. The walking was difficult. Vision was strictly limited. Often we were unable to see 50 feet. In the direction of a glitter that must be water, we were startled to see an unmistakable flash of white. We were staring straight at an adult whooping crane. In another moment, we saw a second bird. We were on the spot. It is real. It is no longer unknown. It is, in truth, the lost place and only man could reach them here and do them harm. Though man could not yet reach and harm the birds in remote Wood Buffalo Park, he could at their wintering ground. When the flock returned to the Aransas Refuge in Texas that fall, there was a new threat. The United States Air Force announced that it would use photo flash bombs on its nearby bombing range. Would the cranes be driven from their winter home by bombing? Not if Canadian and American conservationists could stop it. The protest went to the highest level. The Canadian ambassador presents his compliments to the Secretary of State of the United States of America and has the honor to draw his attention to a proposed photo flash bombing range. It is hoped that the existence of the whooping crane will not be imperiled at a time when the prospects for the increase of the species have at last become bright. Ten days later, a bare moment in diplomatic time, a reply. The Secretary of State presents his compliments to His Excellency, the Ambassador of Canada, and has the honor to report that the Department of the Air Force is withdrawing its proposal. The prospect for the species indeed looked bright.
Year after year, Canadian and American biologists continued to study the cranes. Their combined findings would radically alter the crusade to save the birds. The mating cranes arrive at Wood Buffalo Park about the 1st of May, and each pair takes over a nest area at least a mile from any other pair. Eggs are laid shortly after their arrival, normally a clutch of two. But despite the constant care of both parents, only one chick from a two-egg clutch normally survives to flight age. The numbers of successful nesting pairs are astonishingly small. In any one summer, as few as one pair, a maximum of 16. The lone juvenile birds do not summer at the park. No one knows, even today, where they do go. But significantly, the highest casualty rate is among these juveniles until they pair off. Food for the nesting pairs in Wood Buffalo Park is not as plentiful and varied as it is in Texas. Though there are frogs and mollusks, the cranes seem to live chiefly on dragonfly nymphs. Whooping crane chicks are aggressive. There is a good deal of vigorous sparring and the firstborn usually dominates. Their fighting is generally ignored by the parents. By the time the second chick is three or four days old, they leave the nest to forage with their parents. About a week after hatching, the family leaves the open nesting area for the less exposed ridges, though remaining in their own nesting territory. From then until their October migration, little is known about the fate of the fast-growing chicks. But only about half of them survive to reach the wintering ground. No one knows why. Now, the number of cranes that left Wood Buffalo National Park could be compared with those arriving in Texas, particularly the birds hatched that summer. In at least two years, not a single chick safely reached the wintering ground. On the average, only about half of them survive their first six months. No one knows why. Today. Yeah, 48, Frank. Uh, 46 adults and only two young. We've got. Uh, oh, yeah. How many on Matagorda now? Four pair of adults on Matagorda. Yeah. Then a single pair up here on St. Charles, off across the bay on, on Lamar Peninsula. And one single bird on Welder Point. The rest of our birds are right along the edge of the, the refuge. Mm -hmm. Well, he wasn't. Their findings agreed with those made at the nesting ground. Uh, Almost never did a pair return with more than one young. The greatest casualties were among the lone juveniles. The breeding flock was small and aging, seemingly doomed to extinction. Looks like about the same number as last year. Yes, sir. No increase at all that I can see. Well, at least it's no decrease from last year. This right. is progress, I guess. Holding our own anyway. Yeah. But often it appeared that the cranes could not hold their own. Twelve years earlier, the count read like the obituary of a species. No young birds reared, 10 birds lost. The wild flock was down to 28. It was a gain of only 10 birds in 25 years. 
a depressingly familiar pattern. Once again, it seemed, captive breeding might be essential to survival of the species. But Josephine and Crip were the only captive cranes, and they had no living offspring. Then, success. After eight more years, Josephine and Crip hatched out two chicks, and they thrived. They were named George and Georgette after George Douglas. Josephine did him proud, producing eggs every season. But despite all his efforts, Josephine and Crip raised only two more chicks over all those years in New Orleans. The ends of these feathers are shoved under, that is the roots of the feathers are shoved under and glued in place and another one just laminated over it like you would put the shingles on a house or something. When it all gets done, well, it will present quite a, a realistic hooping crane. Uh, of course, this will be the major help that we have in making this bird look nice and white and, and beautiful like it was in nature. By the time she died, at least 30 years old, Josephine had produced more than 50 eggs, but only four of her chicks survived to maturity. Crip was once again alone. Captive breeding, it then seemed, could not save the great white bird. It is not our wish to see this noble species preserved only behind wire, a faded, flightless, unhappy imitation of his free-flying brethren. But Alan was dead. He had fought passionately to the end for the wild flock, but his gallant belief was tinged with pessimism. As the human population curve goes up, the whooping crane curve goes down. If we succeed in preserving this wild remnant, it will be no credit to us. The glory will rest on this bird whose stubborn vigor has kept it alive in the face of seemingly hopeless odds. It was the end of the first crusade. Who now would champion the crane? If this one colony can be productive, Without the birds that migrating, this is the whole problem. It's the only crane in the world that makes this long migration. If these birds could be stabilized, be, could be kept in one... The new champions were quiet, circumspect men, committee men, and most of them believed in captive breeding as an essential alternative. Though occasionally there were echoes of Robert Porter Allen's particular passion for the wild flock. Well, instinct has told this bird for many generations of that beautiful flight of migration and then the mating habit afterwards was worthwhile doing. We're trying to destroy that. Taking them into captivity does not uh, destroy this instinct so long as your uh, genetic representation and so long as the mortality factors do not change the genetic pattern of the wild population. The new crusaders were, in fact, chiefly scientists in the service of the United States and Canadian governments. It seems to me the egg lifting program is one of the strongest we have to carry out now to help these birds out. And if there was 30 eggs and we'd have got 10 of them, I'll bet you we'd had at least five more cranes this year. Captive breeding did seem to make sense as an alternative, as an insurance program. Evidence from the nesting grounds showed that the wild flock was getting dangerously older, dangerously more vulnerable. The idea of taking eggs from the wild to raise captive birds had been talked about. But now there was a known source of wild eggs at Wood Buffalo National Park. And far south in Maryland, there was now the Patuxent Wildlife Research Center, where the scientific hatching of wild eggs of other species had been successfully carried out for years. Politicians were learning that if birds had no votes, bird lovers did. 
and that to a fast-growing number of North Americans, wildlife was no longer just something to kill. Hard to know just what she ordinarily will react best with the people who care for her daily. Under the direction of Dr. Ray Erickson of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, a rare and endangered project to investigate ways of saving wild creatures from extinction had been set up with funds voted by the United well, States she Congress. Raised, right? She was raised at the San Antonio Zoo up till the time she was about a little over three weeks old, and then she was brought to Texas. And she's uh, been with Canis, the bird which was picked up following an injury in Wood Buffalo National Park. And uh, they have not formed a good partnership because of the fact that she's been imprinted on people. She and Canis never made it. Imprinting, the attachment of birds at certain critical ages to human beings, turns them off sexually for other birds. A problem Patuxent had successfully avoided with another species of crane, sandhill crane, the plentiful cousins of the hoopers. Ray Erickson's staff had already carried out extensive research with sandhills to develop safe procedures with them before risking experiments with the whooping cranes raised at Patuxent, if they could be raised. One of these experiments the incubation and rearing of sandhill chicks from wild eggs would have particular significance to the future of the whooping crane. We found one more nest on our last flight, and we left it. We left it at that, even though we had. A... Now you had two nests uh, on your first flight that had two eggs. Didn't yeah. You? Number one and number two. One number of these one. has only one egg anyway. Now, this is Ernie Kite, biologist with the Canadian Wildlife Service. Along with Ray Erickson, he headed the Canadian-American project at Fort Smith, Northwest Territories, to gather eggs from the nesting grounds at Wood Buffalo National Park, 75 miles to the west. When we spot the bird on the nest, we'll go directly to the, to the marsh. How high do you want to come in there? Uh, we'll come, come in from about uh, 800 or, or so feet. Okay. How's that sound? Good. Yeah. We can spot the, the eggs would be gathered about two days before they were due to hatch when the parents were most protective of the nest and least likely to be permanently driven off by the helicopter. Uh, nest number four, pass over three, 13, and 10, and then go back to Fort Smith with our first load of eggs. Ernie Kite is taking a single wild whooping crane egg. Since a clutch of two eggs rarely results in two mature whooping cranes reaching flight age, the wild flock would not be harmed by the removal of one egg from each two egg clutch. That was the theory of Operation Egg Lift. But despite the successful experiments with sand hills and the careful preparation, it was a gamble. As Ernie Kite put it, nobody knew what would happen, though we were reasonably confident. The cranes might abandon their disturbed nests, dooming the remaining egg. Or the whole flock might abandon their last nesting place forever. But the gamble was taken. Ernie Kite took those eggs over several seasons. Not consecutive seasons, for the effect on the wild flock would be carefully watched. Its success in off years compared with the years in which eggs were taken. Mm. Oh, how about that? 
pretty clean. Nice. Number one. The stolen eggs were handled like, well, like stolen eggs. Number 12. That's cool. Uh, Ernie was a bird off the nest. Which one was that again? Number, number 12. Yeah, she may have been off at the approach of the Number seven. This is a good big one. I think about that one, then. Number seven. I'd say that's, number, that's a good warm egg scoop. Seven warm. Number seven warm. Number 15. That's a long one. Yeah, nice one. That's slightly warm. Slightly warm, I think. Yeah. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten out of 15 are on the nest. Those that are not on the nest are standing on the narrow ridges separating the pond. So in other words, they can see the nest. Yeah. Sound like you're all right. So I think it's okay. Yeah, good. The northern half of the gamble paid off. Operation Egg Lift went smoothly, more than smoothly. When one egg was removed, the nesting pair went right on hatching the remaining egg. During three out of four summers of egg lifting, record numbers of chicks were raised by the wild flock. The whooping cranes, as always, were unpredictable. After an overnight halt at Fort Smith, the precious eggs were transferred to a fast jet with, uh, you could say, an armed escort for the long flight to Maryland. Because the effect that jet high altitudes might have on the eggs was not known, and they were close to hatching, they fed oxygen around them regularly. Hopefully. At the Patuxent Center, the southern part of the gamble began with all night watches and listenings of the incubating eggs. Success at Patuxent. For the first time, the eggs of wild whooping cranes had been artificially hatched. Weight of this newborn chick, 10 ounces. To prevent the chicks, just as aggressive as wild whooping cranes, from injuring one another, they were raised with young turkeys. The turkeys were intended to be like animated punching bags or perhaps pecking bags. The Patuxent scientist took no chances that the young chicks could be imprinted on humans at this critical period. They observed them from people. They start uh, replacing it. Uh, in fact, you start seeing some, seeing some uh, white feathers coming in right oh, yeah. under the neck. Sure. And uh, uh, gradually the back between the wings, when the wing is spread, you can see the white in the back. Uh, with birds that we don't intend to return to the wild like these, we don't worry about them becoming uh, too tame because the more accustomed they are to people, the more likely they will tolerate uh, disturbance and uh, be willing to breed in captivity. At this age, the birds have passed the critical period where they could become sexually imprinted on humans. Again, success at Patuxent. From 50 wild eggs, 19 mature whooping cranes. Better than the survival average at Wood Buffalo Park. The gamble seemed to be paying off handsomely. Now they must wait, as they had in the Sandhill experiment, for the selected pairs of first year birds to mate. An estimated five to seven years. At the fifth year, they began to watch, secretly. Through the sixth year, the birds remained distant.
and they watched. Seven years, eight years. Occasionally, a pair would begin the dance of the whooping cranes, but some biologists blamed the sultry Maryland weather. I don't blame them for not mating. I wouldn't want to do it myself, not in that heat, said one. But Ray Erickson was not discouraged. The success with the sandhill cranes would surely be duplicated with the whoopers. If the whooping cranes were reluctant to mate naturally, Patuxent would, well, help them. They began artificial insemination using canis as a sperm bank. It was a routine technique which had worked with the young sandhills, who then eventually mated without such help. The artificial mating produced two fertile eggs, and one chick hatched out. But the scientist's joy did not last long. The chick lived only 17 days. The whooping crane, that ornery bird which continues to resist crusaders, pressure mounted for a new approach. What I'd like to know is, uh, do we have a plan for continuing uh, work with the whooping crane? Uh, that is a definite plan, a, a plan of attack. Has this been decided on and uh, what will it incorporate? Uh, I think this is perhaps the most valid question that could be asked at this society. Alan Lockery, Director General of the Canadian Wildlife Service. I think that it's very important that we develop goals or objectives for whooping crane management. Uh, I think what's coming out of the discussion today is why wait for Patuxent? Let's make a shortcut here. Let's take eggs from the wild, put them under whooping cranes, or rather sandhill cranes in some place, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Louisiana, Michigan, you name it. Everyone's got an idea here, a solution. Uh, sure, but there are a lot of things that have to be known. Much was already known as a result of Patuxent's research with sandhill cranes. The idea was, simply, to use the plentiful greater sandhill cranes in the wild as foster parents for whooper eggs taken from Wood Buffalo Park. It was an idea whose time had come. The choice of a location for the wild fostering program was easy. At Gray's Lake National Wildlife Refuge in Idaho, summer home of a big flock of greater sandhill cranes, biologist Rod Druin, over several summers, had identified, banded, and rated the suitability of 250 pairs of sandhills as future foster parents for eggs hatched at Patuxent. But until the Patuxent whoopers became productive, the attempt to create a second wild flock of whooping cranes would be initiated with wild eggs from Wood Buffalo National Park. <coughs> so here's Ernie Kite again, and Ray Erickson, with their cases of whooping crane eggs fresh from the Northwest Territories. Thank you. We're going to put them under these sandhill crane eggs today. And uh, these birds are all pre-selected. They're sitting on their nests. On some of the nests, we have removed one egg already. Uh, the birds have come back and are incubating the remaining egg. And we're going to substitute these eggs right now. Now, the problem is, of course, getting these eggs hatched. That's the first step. Uh, when you increase the altitude on eggs, there is a slight reduction in hatchability. And as I remember correctly, Ernie told me it's around 800 feet 
up there yeah, that's right. You're on the nest ground. Feet. Yeah. And up here we're almost 6,400 feet. They are embarking on yet another gamble in the crusade to save the whooping crane. So many unanswered questions. Would the young whoopers, if they hatched, survive in a habitat so different from the nesting grounds at Wood Buffalo Park? If they did survive, would they take on the characteristics of their foster parents, becoming sandhill cranes in all but the color of their plumage? And the immediate, basic, worrisome question. Would the Sandhill foster parents simply reject the strange eggs that were to be substituted for their own? was another gamble, but what else to do? The captive breeding program was delayed. The wild flock of whooping cranes was barely surviving. So, however risky, fostering must be tried. See, there, it's about the same size eggs there's no difference. Well, there's there's little this, this difference. one's probably a little smaller and blunter than the than right. most of them. The others are quite uh, are a bit larger. They're both them. Very very so, similar. So uh, Yeah, yeah. the sand hill is bigger. Well, that's what I said. This is quite yeah, a blunt, a small blunt egg. Yeah. It's not as large as that one. That's quite a nice nest, eh? Cattail, yeah. too. Interesting. Yeah. Cattail, grasses. Yeah. Fourteen of the 31 eggs laid at Wood Buffalo Park that season were gathered. And at Gray's Lake, 14 carefully selected pairs of nesting sandhill cranes were chosen as foster parents for the whooping crane egg. One egg for each pair. They better pan out, huh? They better do. We go do that. They did do. They did pan out. Nine healthy whooping crane chicks were hatched out by the sandhill foster parents. Nine out of 14 eggs, a remarkable achievement. And the stubborn whooping crane characteristics survived in the chicks. When they are disturbed, sandhill cranes head for the highland, whoopers head for the water. To the consternation of their foster parents, the whooper chicks took the water route. Success at Gray's Lake, at least initial success. Will the foster parent program result in a new wild flock of whooping cranes? It all depends upon whether or not the whooping crane chicks eventually mate with each other. And that no one knows, or will know, until at least the year 1980.